knowing their own stories and how uh, Jesus is, King Jesus has changed your lives. What a joy to open up and hear God's word read. Well, good morning. Welcome. I'm so glad to worship with you this morning. My name is Pastor Nate. And to those of you who are visiting this morning, a special welcome, especially if you're from out of town and you decide to drop in to see family and just a, a joy to be able to have all the kids in the house. If you're, if you're under the age of 18, just wave your hand real quick. Wave your hand. All right, come on. Let's give the kids a hand and welcome them. You know, kids, we're so glad you're here. Students, teens, we're, we're just grateful to be a part of this family. And I want you to know that, that you're part of the family now. You're part of God's mission now. You don't have to wait till you get old and a little bit rounder like me. Like God has a mission for you right now. I was looking at our student section right here. And a special joy to have my, my college son, my, my firstborn, Gabriel's in the house uh, as he's back from college for, for the weekend. It's been fun having a full house. And uh, those of you guys who are online, some of you guys are traveling. We just want to say we, we miss you. We look forward to when you're with us. I'm thinking of you, Jen, uh, Sister Jen. She's one of our deacons. Jen, I know you're battling illness and you would be here if you uh, weren't and yet you have continued to serve us even as you pray for us as you've been part of the alpha team for so long praying even when we don't see you you are fierce and strong in your faith in Jesus and we're a better church because of you so we're, we're looking forward to being able to see you as well so hey this this morning we're opening up our, our Advent series and we'll be in this series over the next a uh, few weeks is leading up into the Christmas season, and some of you who uh, uh, maybe you're 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 the curmudgeonly folks, and you you're like it's not. December, so it's not Christmas season. Others of you, you have been playing Christmas music since October. Wave your hand if you've been playing Christmas music. Okay, uh, repent, repent. <laughs> You know, Advent is really uh, this time and season where it, it's all about expectation. Uh, it's about this expectation uh, as we celebrate and think about the arrival of King Jesus. And, uh, and, 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 and today, this is kind of the opening of the series as we will walk through uh, the, the the, the story of Advent, and we've been in the Gospel of Luke for the last several months, and we are backing up to the very beginning of the story. And uh, in, in a way, I'm kind of been tasked with giving you the prequel. Uh, if you've watched uh, any movie series, Star Wars, uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, they, 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 they start out with you're in the story, you, re, you, you watch the three movies, and then years later, they come out with the prequel. Well, today, in a sense, I'm giving you the prequel. Now, I have to give you a spoiler alert about, about the prequel. Jesus is going to be born, y'all, in a few weeks. Just so that you know, just he's going to be born. So uh, we're not changing the story, but we're backing up uh, before that. But all this is about, as we jump into the Advent series, it's all about expectations. Now, I got, I got a number of kids in the house, and, and kids, you can kind of help me. When you think about Christmas, what is the thing that you look forward to the most and expect the most? Be honest. What do you expect the most and look forward to the most? Just somebody shout it. Presents. Presents. All right, we got one honest child up in here. You know, some of y'all are like, well, I'm looking forward to celebrating King Jesus. Well, that's so good. But we know you're not telling the truth. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, we are, we, Christmas is all about King Jesus. But one of the things we all look forward to is presence. It's about the expectation that on Christmas, we're going to open up presence. Expectations. There's something about expectations that we all carry with us. Like expectations are kind of a big deal, whether we speak them out or not, they are operating and present with us. And it's gonna show up in our text this morning. Expectations, we're here in Chicago. And if you're visiting Chicago and you uh, are looking for the best deep dish pizza in Chicago, you might expect that if you ask about that, that you would expect to hear an answer uh, uh, like, Giordano's. 
Now, the thing is, I just saw Sister Dawn over here. She, she's from Chicago, so she, she shook her head. She said, no, if you have an expectation, I'm sorry, Giordano's family, but it's, it is what it is. Can't handle the truth, it's on you. You don't go to Giordano's if you're looking for the best deep dish pizza in Chicago. You go there if you're looking for the best deep dish bowl of cheese and dough. If you're from Chicago, you know, you, if you want the best deep dish pizza, if you want to see that expectation fulfilled, you go to Lou Malnati's. Can I get a witness? Some of y'all thinking like, what about Pizza Hut? Even the Lord are working your heart this morning. See, expectation shapes, shapes us. And Advent is all about expectation. The word, the word means arrival and it, it, it carries this connotation of looking forward, expecting something. Well, we'll be in Luke chapter one this morning as uh, we heard read earlier. If you have a blue Bible, if you need a Bible, grab one out of the seat in front of you. Or if you're in the risers, there's a Bible on the bookshelf. We'll be on page 855 in Luke chapter one this morning. And we will jump right in as I pray over this time. God, we thank you for the privilege to open your word. We thank you for the privilege to consider the expectation of your arrival, that even as we look at this story and the, consider the expectation of the one who would prepare for your arrival, we ask God that you would speak to us and that you would minister to us that we might hear and respond in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in Luke chapter one and we've read through, but I wanna jump into verse Uh, Five, And I just wanted to look at this first little phrase here. And it says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. We need to locate ourselves of what's happening in the storyline in this moment. These are the people of uh, of God, the Israelites, uh, God's people. And he's revealed himself to them. Uh, He has promised to them and uh, that through them, all the families of the nations would be blessed. He has promised that they would enter and be in a land that's flowing with milk and honey. He has given them this sort of promise. And over the millennia, they have gone back and forth where they've rebelled against God over and over again. And the point has come where he has now disciplined them and they're in this period of time where they've experienced the discipline and the hand of God. And as we enter our story, uh, we're, we're in this moment where, where God, although he had revealed himself through prophets and spoke to them, he has been silent for 400 years. No word from God has been spoken since the last prophet. They're in a time where they were experiencing conquest over them. A time where they were displaced. A time where they were occupied by another foreign land. They're in a time where to be Uh, Jewish in Palestine at that time, they would have this constant sense of anger, frustration, even outrage. This was a fraught time. This is a people who were exhausted. This was a people who were were ready to revolt because they couldn't take it anymore. And they had an expectation that there was going to be a king who would come and deliver them. Now you have to imagine that that it, it, locating yourself in that context when when they think about the prophets and all the all the prophecies of what meant that there would be a deliverer, a king, a Messiah that would come. When they had an expectation, this was much more than just the the the, the kind of the cutesy little you know expectation we have that we're going to have gifts on Christmas Day. No, this was a deep soul filling expectation. 
And, and at this time, as if Herod was king, this is Herod the Great. Herod the Great was uh, established as king by the Roman Empire that he would rule in that area for, uh, and he'd been ruling for about 40 years at the time of when this is written and or this account happens. And, and, and Herod himself, in some ways, he, uh, he, he was sort of demented and deluded and he actually thought and desired to be that king, that Messiah. We get a little window into how twisted Herod was. This, this man was obsessed with himself. He was obsessed with his legacy. He was obsessed with holding on to the rule over the people. And he was someone who would put, uh, he, he was so, so, so demented that he would, he would destroy his own people to preserve his own power. You can read more about that in another day in Matthew chapter two. So you have a people who are occupied, people who are conquered and under the rule of a king who by no means would be great. This was a people who had great expectations. And now we find ourselves, having looked at the expectation of the people, we find ourselves here in verse five, where it says, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. So you have Zechariah who is, uh, he's in the priestly line. He's a Levite. He is someone who, who represents uh, the people before God as he serves alongside other priests. And uh, he, he's born in this sort of noble line of people in the Jewish community. And then his wife, uh, uh, Elizabeth, comes from a, a noble line of the priestly line in that she comes from the line of Aaron, who is the first priest. So this is like a power ministry couple. He notice it says they are commended for the quality of their character and of their faithful obedience to God. God, when he viewed their, their attention to his word and obedience to him, he commended them as they were blameless. They were consistent in living according to the, the demands that his commandments and statutes had set forth. They were faithful to follow that which they knew. But yet there's a problem. You see this? says they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. So you have to wonder what were their expectations? What were their expectations? I mean, uh, we know that in their attention to obeying God that, uh, and being obedient to what they knew had been revealed in what was the Old Testament at the time that they, they were expecting that God would be honored by their faithfulness and obedience. And we could also, in, in some ways, we could imagine that and understand that they, they had an expectation that they were not going to have children because it says that Elizabeth was barren. You see these two things. She was unable to have children. She was afflicted with infertility. I mean, her body betrayed her, would not allow her to carry a child in the womb and we don't know how long this had been something that afflicted her, but we could have some sense that, that in that culture, at least, that, that, that they married at a younger age than we typically do. In our culture, like maybe in their uh, late teens at the, at the latest, and they were advanced in years. So they've been married a long time. So this was something that they had come to understanding and realization that this it was impossible for her to have children. Now, I know not all of us in the room understand that deep 
kind of a pain. Uh, you know, some, of the, some of the sisters in the house who have walked through those season, a season of infertility or you're in it right now, it, 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 is a, it can be a soul crushing experience where you're grieving, uh, grieving a loss that you haven't been able to hold. So Elizabeth is barren. Remember, they're still righteous and faithful to God, but then not just there that she's barren. It says they were both advanced in years. In the Greek, that means they were old. They were old. You know, you drive down the Kennedy here in Chicago, south on the Kennedy, and you see that big, that big, uh, uh, billboard and it's the old national bank. And they have this little thing that say, get old. Get old. These were old people. They were out of range of having children. Now we just had uh, Thanksgiving and maybe you had people come in. Maybe you uh, had your family come visit you or you went to visit them. Or maybe we have even some of those. We got any grandmas and grandpas here? Anybody, if you're a grandma or grandpa, just wave your hand. Go ahead, wave your hand. All right, we got, a, oh, we got some grandma. Man, you look kind of young to be a grandpa. Okay, that's all right. He said... I look good, I know. Anyway, <laughs> I still got it. A grandma and grandpa, right? So, uh, so, so, so imagine at Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner, you sit down at the table and grandma and grandpa and say, they, they say, guys, we have some news. <laughs> well, you know your grandfather and I, we're having a baby. Can you imagine that? Okay, all right, grandma and grandma, can, grandpas, can you imagine having a baby now? I'm, gonna, I'm looking at David and Julia. She's like, no, sir, no, sir. It's good to be grandparents, but having another child, forget that. No, no, no. This, they, they are so far advanced. They are in the age of being grandparents. So not only is she infertile, but she's in the stage. He's in the stage where they should, their kids should be having kids. So they have absolutely zero expectation that they're going to have a child. Zero. And yet, they're still faithful and obedient. Understand this, that, that, that while, you know, our cultural moment, if you have kids, if you don't have kids, it's like, hey, it's up to you if you want to do your thing or not. It doesn't matter. It's your life. Live your life. In that culture, for a woman to not have children, it was considered to be a disgrace. What kind of woman are you? You can't even have a child. What are you worth? And yet, despite the reality of that stinging pain, Elizabeth and Zechariah are faithful. But they also, they also had to have held on to this expectation that all the promises that God had made, that the prophecies, the, the word of God, it was true that there was going to be a deliverer sent to the people. But as he typically does, God interrupts and disrupts their expectations. And I would suggest to you this morning that in this Advent season, perhaps God wants to disrupt your expectations as well. Look what he does. Look what he says. Luke says, now while, they, he, was, now while he, that is Zechariah, was serving as priest before God, when this, his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside of the hour of incense. There at the time are 24 divisions of the priesthood, according to historian Josephus. They serve twice a year in this particular case to serve in this way, uh, Zechariah, this would have been for a priest, he would have done this one time in his lifetime. 
The one time he serves this way in his priestly career to go into the temple, to go to the Holy of Holies, God steps in. Look at verse 11 and 12. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. God steps in, sends the angel. We know it's Gabriel, if you continue to read the passage, to disrupt their expectations. You see how Zechariah is troubled. It says he, he, he fear fell upon him. He was terrified. Now, now, some of you all know what I'm talking about. Have you ever like arrived at home and you thought you were the only one at home? And so like, you're just doing your thing. Maybe you're unpacking your bag or you're putting dishes away and then you hear a voice and you're like, I thought I was home alone. What happens to you? Now, you know, my wife and I, we joke about this. My wife is more curious. She's like, I'm gonna find out who that is. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> You can have what you want. I'm out of here. You ain't supposed to be here. I'm, they ain't going to get me. You can have my TV. You ain't taking me. You don't, your, your, your fear comes because you're not expecting to hear a voice. And that's exactly what happens. Zechariah is not expecting to hear or see anyone as he goes in. And yet God meets him to disrupt his expectations. And, and to go a step further, God interrupts Zechariah's and Elizabeth's expectations by giving them a completely different set of things to expect. God's gonna give his expectations. Let me, let me ask you this morning, Park near North, are you in a posture to receive God disrupting your expectations so he can give you his. Look at verse 13. We've looked at the nation's expectations, Zechariah and Elizabeth's expectations, and now what expectations do we find out that God has? Look at verse 13, it says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid Zechariah for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. After all of what the people of Israel had been experiencing and expecting, and after all of what, Zechariah and Elizabeth had expected, God is making clear what he expects. You know, the difference between your expectations and God's expectations when it comes to what's gonna happen. You know, sometimes I come home and I expect that my children are gonna be like, dad, how can I serve you? I can expect all I want to. But reality is a different story. Now, when God says, I'm expecting this is going to happen, it is as good as gold. It is going to happen. So, so what does God say in this moment? Do you notice first that God says something? He says, your prayer has been answered. Your prayer has been answered. Now, what's one thing that you notice about this text? Do we see what prayer Zechariah had prayed? It's not in the text. It's not in the text. And so we could, there's, there's kind of two things we could imagine that Zechariah would have prayed. And the first would be that he was interceding 
to God on behalf of his people, uh, uh, the nation of Israel, as he was performing his priestly duties, God send a deliverer, uh, God forgive us, God be merciful to us. Uh, But secondly, and perhaps maybe more painfully, we, we might recognize that Zechariah had evidently prayed another prayer. That Zechariah and Elizabeth had at some point asked God to grant them a child. Well, we don't know is how long ago it was, but we have an idea though, because because apparently uh, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth are advanced in years, she's barren. So they had gone through some period of time where they were asking God, will you give us a child? Now they move into the season of when they're grandparents, so they don't have this expectation anymore. So apparently the prayer that God is answering is a prayer that they aren't even praying. And you can imagine that in that gap, that prayers they had prayed with expectation to their God and King that they thought he forgot about, he had not forgotten. If there's just one thing you remember this morning for some of you is that some of the prayers that you have gone to God our King with that you yourself have lost expectation. Maybe it's prayer for healing, prayer for a restoration of a relationship. Maybe it's a prayer for for your lost child to come back to faith in Christ. Maybe it's a prayer for God to move in a way that you think is impossible. Sometimes the prayers that you prayed that you stopped praying, God has not forgotten and he's gonna do something. He's gonna break your expectation. God says, you're gonna have a son. You and Elizabeth will have joy and gladness. Many people will rejoice. This child's gonna be great before the Lord. This child from birth is gonna be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, we got kids in here. Let's not believe less for them than what God can do that he can use a child even. He will turn many of the Israelites, his people to the Lord, their God. He will go before the Lord. He's gonna be the forerunner to announce and declare that the king is coming. He's gonna turn the hearts of fathers, parents to their children. He's going to turn the disobedient to wisdom and justice. He's, he's gonna make people, the people ready to receive the coming king. That's what I expect is gonna happen. That's what God says to this couple who had lost all expectation that they would ever have a child. You're not just gonna have a child, you're gonna have a child that's gonna prepare the way of the coming king. So what happens then? We got the people's expectations, we got Zechariah and Elizabeth's expectations. We have God's expectations and look what happens at the rest. It says in verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advancing years and and then skip skip through to verse 23. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Now we we see that Zechariah literally reacts like, I can't believe this is gonna happen. This is impossible. Gabriel says, okay, you don't believe me? Then I'm not gonna let you talk for another till the baby gets, gets, is delivered. And so he gets a little bit of rebuke, but it doesn't change despite Zechariah clinging to his old expectation. It doesn't change that the new expectations that God has set are still going to happen. Isn't it good that God in his grace will still do his good thing even when we doubt? Even when we're like, I don't, God, I don't know how you're gonna do that. I don't think that's possible. God's like, that's okay. Just be quiet and let me do my thing. Look at verse 24. He goes home from his service in the priestly temple and comes home. And after these days, his wife, Elizabeth conceived and for five months, she kept herself hidden saying, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. I mean, think about this. Elizabeth is a grandma who is barren 
with no expectation of having a baby. Now you gotta, you gotta think about this. You're like, why did she hide herself for five months? First of all, now I've never been pregnant before, but it affects your body. Now, those of you who are in the childbearing years, you, you, you're accustomed to that. But, but the thing about this, if you're a grandma and you are barren, when you get pregnant, I don't think her first reaction was like, praise the Lord, I'm pregnant. I think, I think she was just like, she probably like, just think about this. She's probably like for a few weeks, she's like, I feel weird. Like what's going on with me? Another week happens. She's like, what, 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 what's happening? Hey, Elizabeth, let's, you know, come over, let's have dinner. She's like, I'm not feeling well, I'm kind of nauseous. Why are you nauseous? I have no idea. Weeks and she realizes that everything she had expected had been turned upside down by the God who breaks in with his expectations. And then you see her, that realization and the gratitude just overflows as she, she suddenly realizes this is happening and, and her expectations are completely flipped over because God interrupts. So as we enter into this Advent season, let me ask you, what about you? Have you ever inspected your expectations? It's the Christmas season. There's a lot of expectation in the Christmas season. You know, it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the hap happiest season of all, or maybe not. Maybe it's the most disappointing time of the year. Maybe it's the most loneliest time of the year. Maybe it's the most frustrating season of all. Maybe it's the sad, saddest season of all for some of us. We should inspect our expectations. Friends, what have we longed and prayed for that we no longer expect God to do? I remember a few, this a few years back or not even a few years, several years back, uh, my mother-in-law, Teresa Grabowski, she is, she was a, uh, she was one of those just feisty, strong, hardworking Chicago women. She worked a minimum wage job for, uh, to take care of her four girls, including my wife here in Chicago, just a few miles from where we are right now, getting on the bus and the train every morning in the snow, walking through high snow, high winds to get to her job, to provide for her family. She was, she was tough. And I remember the first time that I met her and I was interested in her daughter. And I was like, you know, I, you know, I was put on the charm. Hey, Teresa, how you doing? And you know, y'all, I still remember. She looked at me like I was crazy. She was like, who are you? She was not smiling. She was not smiling. <laughs> My wife and I were laughing about this. She wasn't like, hey, it's Pastor Nate. She's like, I don't know who you are and who you is, what you about. Why? Because she was concerned about her daughter. And uh, she, was, she was so sweet. We got married and 
for a number of years, my wife, she was the first follower of Jesus in her family. And so my wife was the kind of the trailblazer as she longed to see her family come to faith in Jesus and experience all the life and peace and forgiveness and joy uh, that Christ offers, King Jesus offers. And so she had been praying for years before I even met her for her mom to come to faith in Jesus and experience this. So when we got married, it was a prayer that we were praying regularly. Oh God, bring Teresa to faith in Jesus. Almost three decades, we prayed that prayer. And I, I remember when I first started praying, you know, you have that like kind of confidence when you first start praying about something like, Psh, man, God's gonna do something. God change your heart, change your life. We know it's gonna happen. And then after, you know, a decade, well, well Lord, maybe, uh, Lord. And then after two decades, uh, okay, well, and so many times, uh, the confidence started to wane. And then Teresa got a diagnosis of stage four cancer. Metastatic. She had months to live. And frankly, I'm being, being transparent with y'all. At the time, it seemed improbable that she was gonna to come to faith in Jesus. I would almost say it seemed impossible. It seemed impossible that God would be able to answer that prayer. My expectations, I'm not saying for my wife, my expectations were low. But God, but God. And what do you know? As my wife could testify, she would tell the story in the moments, the, the, really the last hours of her life, the last day, the last hours of her life, she came to faith in Jesus. She came to faith in Jesus experiencing forgiveness and she's with him now, healed and whole. See, God answered this prayer, even though our, my expectation was low and I'm so grateful that he did. My question for you this morning is what are you expecting? What are you expecting in this season of Advent? of the arrival of King Jesus. What do you need to ask him for? What have you, you need to be reminded to go back to him, to ask him? I'm gonna leave you with this. It's an application for all of us. As a church, you know, we're getting ready to head into this season of Advent. And as we think about the state of our city, how many of us have given up expecting Jesus Christ to do a great work in the city of Chicago. How many of us, as we've read the newspaper lines, as we've looked at what's happening across the city, our world have given up hope and expectation that God is gonna do something great right here in the city of Chicago. Have we given up hope that more and more churches are gonna close? Are we giving up the hope that, that churches, they, they can't be planted, they, they can't, more and, more and more people, more different types of people aren't gonna come into, the relation, into a relationship with Jesus? That's impossible. The city's too far gone. There's too many problems. We're overrun with crime and, and, and broken families and we're overrun with people coming to the city with no resources. We're tapped out. We're in too much debt. There is no hope. God, we can't expect you to do anything significant. Do we believe God's gonna do something great? Will we allow him to disrupt our expectations? You know, this Tuesday is Giving Tuesday. 
And as a church, we're participating with our family of park churches across this city. And what we're saying and participating in Giving Tuesday is that we expect God to do a work in the city of Chicago. We're gonna pour everything that gets given in Giving Tuesday this week into Mission All, which is all about seeing churches planted where people can gather in places like this uh, to hear the good news, not just in places like this though, in, in the hidden places, in nursing homes and in neighborhoods without resources in other languages that maybe you don't speak, but others speak and haven't heard the good news of Jesus. We're gonna pour everything in that to see churches planted, to see the renewal of this city, to see revival in this city. This Tuesday, I wanna challenge you, inspect your expectation, pray, and then believe God is gonna do something great. And if you believe it, give. Yeah, I said it, give. Let's give like we believe that we serve a God who can overturn our expectations. Number 624 to 26 is called the ironic blessing. And it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You'll hear me as your pastor speak that over you so often at the end of our services. It's, it, it's a way to, to commend God's grace to you. And as we close our time together, this is what we're gonna sing. And we're singing this as it's been sung over the millennia of uh, over Jewish people as they have uh, attended to this particular passage in their gatherings, as we as, the, as followers of Jesus, as we recognize that King Jesus has arrived, that he has granted us in him, in his life, his death, his resurrection, he has granted us his presence, his power, his peace. We're gonna sing that with expectation, no matter what your situation, we're gonna sing it with expectation. Because it's not about our expectations, it's about the one who can fulfill them. Pray with me. King Jesus, we love you. We thank you for being such a kind and gracious King to reveal yourself to us, to allow us to sit under your word, to be challenged, oh God, to expect you to do great things, to expect you to move, to expect you to hear and respond to us, not because you owe us, not because we've earned it, but because you're so good. And so God, we pray with expectation that you will move in us this week as we participate in Giving Tuesday. We pray with expectation that you will move in us through this Advent season as we invite friends, as we declare the good news. We, we pray with expectation that you will move in us because that's the kind of God you are. That's the kind of King you are. So God, we sing with expectation over us, over our families, over our friends, over our city.